In today's episode, we're going to be talking with Holly Cahoon. Holly is a seasoned professional with over 20 years of experience in staffing and professional services. As the founder and managing partner of Regions Consulting, Holly brings a wealth of knowledge and expertise to the table. Prior to starting her own firm, Holly held various leadership roles in recruiting, business operations, and IT for full service and clinical research focused staffing firms. She's managed large scale ERP solution implementations and is well versed in front and middle office solutions. Holly certifications as a PMP, Salesforce administrator, and professional and human resources highlights her commitment uh, to professional development and her ability to deliver results. At Regents, Holly leads the IT management consulting practice in providing program and project management expertise to help clients adopt tools, methodologies, and best practices that accelerate delivery of business value for technology projects. We're excited to hear from Holly and learn more about her experience in the staffing industry and beyond. Holly, thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited to have you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here and talking to you today. I love it. So, okay, Holly, I know I've gotten a chance to talk to you a little bit, got to see you at SIA Executive Forum. So for our audience and our listeners, um, tell us a little bit about you and your company. Let our audience know more about Regents Consulting. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so me, for me personally, um, you know, I have been in the industry for the majority of my career. Um, I kind of fell into it, for lack of a better word. Um, interestingly, I was, you know, I had just graduated from college, was working in retail, not happy doing that. And my mother, who actually spent her career in HR and had used staffing services, said, why don't you go see if there's a staffing agency that might be able to help you find something? And so walked in the door, filled out what at the time was paper, literally paperwork, um, and did an interview. Uh, and they said, well, what about working for us? Would you be interested in working for us? And that kind of started me on the journey in staffing, and I have not looked back since. So I've done any number of roles um, from being a recruiter, running a, managing a recruiting team. Um, I've done dabbled a little bit in sales, uh, operations and training for sure. But my passion as it's developed over, over the years has been really around technology and specifically technology for the staffing uh, and professional services industries. And that really has been the impetus for Regents as well. Regents is, has been in business now for uh, going on 12 years. Um, and we, have, we are founded by a, a group of individuals that have been in the industry for our entire careers. Some of them like myself on the business side of things, others having serviced the industry their entire career, but all of us with a passion for bringing technology and digital transformation to the staffing industry and to our customers and clients. So we're a full service systems integrator and happy to announce that we are also now a product company. We've, we're launching a new product called Monarch Middle Office. Um, so we now have both staffing um, services and products. Wow, how exciting. Um, not only you have the team to walk a mile in the shoes, now you have the product to go with that. And I believe you launched that at Executive Forum, correct? That was yes, we did. We had our big launch party. I love it. How very exciting. Um, very cool. Now, as we listen to, I, lo I love hearing this conversation, obviously digital transformation is a buzzword. We've not only heard this year, but previous years, and it just seems to continue to be morphing. So. How does someone in our industry stop and say, you know what, Holly, I need your help? Well, you know, it, some people are like, I don't know what I don't know, or I don't know when to pull the trigger. Is there an ideal client size? Once they hit a certain growth in revenue, number of technologies, maybe there's too many to count. Where do you find is the point that the hand goes up to say, Holly, I need your guidance and Regents guidance uh, for my next step. That's a great question. Uh, I mean, I think in general, our our clients are driven um, and our customers are less kind of size oriented and more kind of where they are in their journey, right? Um, and, and we are a full end to end SI. So we have our customers engage with us all the way from, hey, I know I have a problem I need to solve right? But I don't know exactly how to solve that all the way to I've selected a product. I know what I'm doing. I need to implement that, right? And, and everywhere in between. In terms of guidance, you know, I, I would say it's never too early to engage with, uh, with a firm or with someone that can help support you. I think there's kind of a misnomer um, in this space that, you know, 
you can't afford external support or external services until you reach a certain size. And I think that the really important aspect of that, I would say, is find a partner or a vendor um, that can right size really what you are trying based on what you're trying to accomplish, the level of support that you need um, to help guide you through the journey, whatever that digital transformation journey is. I love that. And what I heard you just say is you may not have a technology picked out, you can just say, hey, I know I need to move a direction and you can help them move through that process even before yes, picking. Absolutely. And and honestly, I think that's maybe one of the one of the best ways to sort of uh, uncomplicate this idea of digital transformation, right? Is is it really should fundamentally come back to your business, right? Your and solving business problems. So in that, you know, you, you know, business owners know very well, right? What, 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 who are they today? What are they trying to become, right? And then what tools do I need to enable me on that journey to get there? And there are a lot of people right now that are working through their technology roadmaps as we have all these AI, all these additional pieces that are coming into our industry itself. So I can only imagine that there are more and more people coming to people like you to say, I need to Absolutely. Help. And it can be one of the great things about our industry now is there's so much new technology. There was a there was a time and certainly I was, uh, you know, in the industry at that time where there just weren't that many choices. There wasn't that much investment in tech. Um, and that landscape has completely changed over the last decade. And that's the great news, right? The, the flip side of that is just how to make sense of it all. <laughs> and, and that's a challenge in itself. So in your experience, this is like one of my favorite questions at this point, where, what your experience is, um, what are some common mistakes that companies make when they integrate technology solutions. I'm sure, you know, there's a lessons learned. You probably have a book about this. Um, but what are the top three that you've kind of come across that are just the common mistakes that organizations yep, I think a great question and a good good um, good way for companies to kind of ground themselves as they start on their journey, right? Uh, the first one I would say is just a lack of clarity about the journey, right? And understanding the journey that you're embarking on requires you to know two things. You need to know where you are today and really have a good understanding of that, right? An honest assessment of where are we, who are we today, and where are we going? Who do we want to become, right? If you don't have clarity around those things, you, you miss out on the opportunity to really be thoughtful and intentional in what technologies you're selecting and how you're implementing those technologies in order to help you on that journey, right? The technology really should be an enabler. It shouldn't be the thing, right? It's the thing that helps you achieve your outcomes and your objectives. So I would say number one would be just a lack of clarity about what is it I'm trying to achieve? What is it I'm trying to accomplish? Um, I think the other big thing that I see the next two probably have to do with uh, change management, but, and so not necessarily about the tech itself, but one is, is not having those business champions inside of your, inside of your organization who are willing, ready, able to lead that change, right? And change is hard. You know, it's, it's not, it's a misnomer to think that technology is a snap your fingers kind of thing and, and I'm in a better place, right? It's still change and change is still hard. So having folks that are willing and able to do that, um, and, and so, some people are and some aren't. So having folks in your organization that are comfortable with taking risks, that are willing to sort of challenge the status quo, you know, just because we're doing it today, is that really the way we should be doing it tomorrow, right? Um, and that willingness to brace, embrace the uncertainty that goes along with change. So I think having those internal to your organization is key to the success because they will drive the adoption within the organization. Um, and then the last thing I would say probably is the expectation that te technology is going to fix your problems, right? It, <laughs> it's easy to think. It's not the magic it is moment. not. It is not. In fact, and I'm sure I'm telling you some, something that you already know. In fact, I think we may have talked about this before. A lot of times these technology implementations and, and technology will actually shine a light on where you have challenges within your organization that you need to overcome. So um, I think having a realistic expectation up front about what technology can and cannot do um, within your organization is, is key in order to have a successful uh, implementation. I love it. And you really talked about something that we always talk about on in our show is really the foundational processes. It really comes down to, you know, yeah, where do you want to go? 
but do you know where you are today? Do you know what processes get you there? Do you know what drives the metrics that uh, that you're seeing in your systems? Do you know like do you know the all the ins and the outs and the root causes behind all of these things? So I love that. And change management was something that we actually covered just a few episodes ago too. And I've I personally seen so many offices that are like, yeah, we're gonna make this change. And people hate surprises. I mean, it, you know, it's like, oh, we're doing this for the better. You want you gotta understand this is where we're going, this is this is good. But some of our teams don't understand the why behind it. They just see a change, they see a pivot, they don't understand the nuance behind the 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 push of where we're going. And you know, I, it's really something when you get your teams involved, the buy-in changes drastically from where you are and what your mission is to the success of those outcomes whenever you involve your team. So I, I've seen a lot of those things go really well by including leaders of teams or peer mentorship programs uh, or, or other things to really ensure that technology implementation. Absolutely. Goes well. I couldn't agree with you more on that, Courtney. I think that's really critical to the success of, of any project. Um, and you mentioned kind of them understanding the why of the change. Ideally, you've engaged them early enough that they're a part of defining the why, right? And so it's not something that's happening to them or something that's happening for them. It's something that they are helping to define and articulate in terms of what, what the outcome is that they want to achieve. Yeah, those are the people that are using your systems day in and day out. You want to make sure that they can express their feelings behind that because you're just going to get a better end result. Absolutely. I love it. I love it. Um, we talked about the common mistakes. So think about when selecting technology solutions for a company. What do you consider to be the most important factors? Mm -hmm. Also a great one. I think, again, not losing sight of it, it, what problem it is you're trying to solve or what outcome it is you're trying to achieve is really important. Um, you know, we all as human beings have a tendency to have the shiny object syndrome, right? something new, something exciting, something that there's a lot of buzz about. Um, but if we don't stop and pause to ask ourselves why we are doing this or how we are actually going to use this technology, what problem it is we're trying to solve, it's going to be difficult to understand or quantify or measure whether or not we've been successful in achieving it. So I would say uh, a big part of the technology selection really doesn't, again, doesn't have to do necessarily with the technology, but understanding clearly what problem you're trying to solve. Um, one of the other things I would think is, a, you know, an e easy pitfall that we see folks fall into is it's easy to focus on the features. Um, but I would say it, it's very important in selecting a technology to focus on the capabilities as well. Um, which are not not the same things, right? It's it's the it's the capabilities are what allows you really to grow, scale, be with that technology solution over the long term, right? The features and functions are the bells and the whistles and the the, the you know the fancy stuff that's been um, you know enabled by the product company, and it's it tends to be the sexy stuff, right? It's the stuff that everybody gets excited about. But foundationally, your technology solution really needs to work for your business and enable you and empower you, uh, the end user, to be able to have that technology be flexible enough, configurable enough for you to be able to change those features and functions as you grow as an organization. So I would say don't forget about that. It's like you know, buying a car and, and uh, not looking under the hood at the engine or the transmission, right? That's not the sexy stuff. It's all the, it's all the lights and displays in front of you when you sit in the driver's seat. But that stuff is really, really important in your technology selection. Um, and then I, I would say as well, make sure the vendor fits within your organization. Um, I've talked about this a little bit when we were talking uh, at SIA about what to automate and when i think that you it's it's easy to forget that you are forming a relationship with a vendor when you select a product um, and and you need to make sure that vendor fits within your values within where you're headed as a company uh, does their roadmap align to you do you know that if you pick up the phone and call them for support that they're going to be there so paying attention to i think the vendor in addition to the technology that's great advice. I love that. And I love the car analogy because you're right. We all want the bells and whistles. The bells and whistles are what got us sold by some snappy commercial or, you know, some some ring-a-ding tune, right, that we're going to yeah. listen to. But it's the point that so many of our technologies that we have, we don't even use to the full capabilities or, you know, we're, we're adding something else when in reality, we might have something right in front of us that already does one of those features. 
And instead of spending more, we can be more efficient, have better, you know, better analytics in our organization. So I love that. I love the car analogy. So thank you for sharing that with us. It's an ever-changing landscape where we are today. How do you stay up to date on the latest trends and developments in technology? I I feel like every day it's like, you know, Lauren Jones does her technology Tuesdays. There's there's so much out there. And I I think it's sorting through like what's good, what's bad. Like, how do you how do you stay up? That's a great question, too. Um, You know, I love Lauren. She's one of my one of my good friends. And I you know, she's certainly one of the avenues. Right. Folks like her that that really love that tech, the technology and have the ability, she has a, you know, a gift to be able to translate that, right, to be the interpreter of that. So having, having access to resources that um, will help you understand the technology, right? Folks like Lauren and, and people like that are, are great. Um, I, I am a big reader, so I, I tend to get consume a lot of, of information by reading books, reading articles, um, it, it's kind of the way that I learn, but I find that, you know, it gives me a little bit more of a focused view on a particular mm-hmm. subject, right? A lot of what we see coming at us now is in sound bites and it makes it a little hard to consume and digest. So I find sometimes that reading, reading gives me the perspective to be able to just focus on a particular problem I'm trying to solve or technology solution I'm trying to understand. Um, and I think certainly organizations, within the industry, there are, there are numerous organizations who, is, who are here really to provide those services to the industry and, and avail yourself of those tools, right? Uh, SIA, ASA, there's tons of organizations out there that are, that are really designed to help provide those kinds of services to the industries and, and be available to you. So avail yourself of those opportunities wherever you can. I love that. That is so true. They have amazing resources that provide up-to-date information. Um, I love, obviously, other networking like Lauren and those people that are, they're there to, to break it down for you in a way that you need to, you need to hear it. You know, sometimes, you know, as you're running your staffing business or your recruiting business, you're, you're not the IT person. You're not hearing the same lingo or, or saying, how does that apply to my business? So uh, being able to lean on the people that do that the best is probably the smartest way to go about that. I love it. What advice would you give to companies looking to adopt a new technology solution? Yeah, I think, um, again, I would say that, you know, setting realistic expectations is probably one of the the biggest pieces of advice that I would say. I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier when we were chatting, but Digital transformation is a buzzword, as you said, right? It's it's big in this space now, but transformation is change on steroids, right? <laughs> and no change, yep. you, you know, is something that's seamless and you go through it without any kind of bumps along the way. So I would say setting realistic expectations um, on what the process is going to look like. Um, and I think, you know, there's a direct correlation and understanding your organization, I think, well enough to know at what rate can you consume that change, right? So, um, you know, can I sustain a full big bang uh, implementation of a product or is that too much for my organization to consume? I think that's probably important in adoption as well. Uh, and then I'd say seeking outside perspectives. Um, I think that's a really important component of any making your way through any kind of change. The vendors that you select have interesting perspectives to share with you, right? They have been inside of multiple customers. They can give you a different perspective on how other people within your space are doing the same things, are, fa- are tackling these challenges and these problems. And they can challenge you to think a little bit differently in the process as well, that I think can, can help you from a, an adoption perspective um, to not sort of recreate your current state when you're trying to transform. And honestly, you said something that I hear a lot of offices talk about. Um, you know, we've we've had some people come over to Crelate and in t- talking with them, it's like, well, I would have never been able to do this last year because last year was so busy. So with the market shift, we've been able to slow down. We've been able to train our people for the adoption that they need for the technology and use it the right way, because otherwise we wouldn't have had the resources to do it prior to. We wouldn't have had the the speed in order to make sure our teams are even using it the right way. And we may have been in the same predicament we were in just a year or three years ago. Absolutely, very, very true. How do you ensure that technology implementations are aligned with a company's business goals? You you talked about that, where they are, where they want to go. I guess 
that's not necessarily something I think that people stop to think, like, is it even important? Um, but how do you ensure that those are aligned? Again, I think this sounds pretty basic and it sounds self-explanatory, but, but really know your goals, right? And be able to articulate those and be specific about them, right? Uh, everybody's got a goal to grow, right? <laughs> so, right, grow and, right, grow and scale. Be more specific, right? Be as specific as you can and make sure that the, that knowledge around what your goals are is really um, shared throughout your organization so that everybody understands that and understands and is driving sort of driving the bus in the same direction. Um, I think um, being conscious and intentional, I think that enables you to be conscious and intentional throughout the process. If you, if you have that, that's sort of your North Star. And and if you're constantly coming back to that in the process, I think that will that will help you to ensure that you're successful and it's aligned to your goals. Um, and then to the extent that you can, I would say for for sure, this is kind of where you are and where you want to go. Um, be, understand how you're measuring that today, and then understand how you are going to measure success um, as an out you know from an outcomes perspective once you achieve where you're headed, right? So being able to document that, being able to have metrics, clear metrics behind that so you can actually see, right? Did I did I actually accomplish it? I love that. You actually pulled me right into my next question. I was going to say something, but I want to go <laughs> right into that. Um, how, you know, people look at something and say, okay, was this successful? How do you measure success of a technology implementation yeah. project? Yeah. That's a great, great question. And it's something that <laughs> And you asked me sense. earlier about kind of common mistakes. I think that, that that's maybe one of those as well, is that people skip over that, you know, how are we going to measure success? And so then you get to the end of the project and, and you're sort of going, well, were we successful? I don't know, right? Um, I think you, you hit on one of them with the previous question, which is, does it achieve, achieve my objectives, right? And, and knowing those is very important and measuring those is very important. And there's various ways you measure that, right? There is There are KPIs that are things like, you know, have I reduced my time to fill? Um, you know, those kinds of very specific things where you're looking at how long did it take me to do X? How long does it take me to produce a, a paycheck or to enter a time card or all of those things? Um, there's also questions of adoption that are important to be asking yourself and measuring um, as part of this process. Are, are the users using it, right? We've, we've implemented X, Y, and Z, and there are ways to measure that. And your vendors should be able to help you with that. How do I measure? You know, how often are they logging in? What pages are they accessing? You know, are we actually using what we've implemented? Um, and I think a big thing that we hear about today, uh, and certainly AI plays a role in this as well and will in the future is, you know, what is the user experience, right? Are we creating a better experience? So yes, they may be using it, but are they having a good experience in that process, right? And you want that experience to be as frictionless as possible. Um, and, and you want to take advantage of every opportunity to improve that. So I would say looking at specific KPIs, what is your adoption? And then what are, what is the experience of the people who are interacting with it? You know, it's funny. We always, in, in the talent industry, we always look, what is our client's mm -hmm. experience with our, you know, with the, with the software, whether it's your client portal, whatever they're experiencing, the interactions with us, but what is your mm -hmm. talent experiencing? But do we ever sit and look so frequently about yeah. our own internal teams. What is their experience using the software yes, we have? In absolutely. Here? I completely agree with that. And that's, that is a key stakeholder that I think gets missed sometimes in this process. And, you know, as you said, then has a, it has a domino effect from an adoption perspective, from a change management perspective. If you're not thinking about those people that are using the system every day and engaging with it. And long-term that can affect oh, your retention absolutely. too. Like, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Learning and development is obviously my passion, but you know, as you get into that, it's employee engagement, it's retention, it's 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 basics 101 whenever you think about those foundational operational. Yeah, processes. and I think you hit on a great thing there that we talked about earlier, which is you know, the technology really shouldn't be the thing, it's enabling your people so to you know to do their jobs better, more efficiently. And so I think making sure that they're along the journey is really, really important. You mentioned AI, and we can't get through a conversation <laughs> without AI. Um, whenever you think of AI, what do you see the future of AI and automation 
being in the staffing yeah. industry. Yeah, that one's been an interesting one. Certainly was a buzzword at SIA, right? Lots of talk about AI, chat GPT, all of these new tools that are out there in, this, in the space, right? Um, I think, you know, near term wh where we're seeing where we're seeing companies utilize AI is in areas like engagement, right? Being able to um, kind of keep that connection uh, where we may have drop off with candidates and recruiting process and things like that. So from an engagement perspective, I think speeding up time to fill and, and the recruitment life cycle is another area where we're seeing AI and automation, right? Sourcing and matching and those kinds of things where we have opportunity to really accelerate the process. Um, and, and then I think, um, you know, what will one of the areas as well as back office automation, it's one that doesn't tend to get as much focus, but but it is an area where uh, we are seeing the use of RPA and things like that to automate manual processes like, you know, entry of, of invoices or um, you know, uh, time entry or loading of time files. So from external sources. So those are all areas where we see that being used today. And so near term, I think uh, removing some of those um, lower value tasks, redundant, repetitive tasks. Um, and I think certainly things that help you accelerate your, your recruitment life cycle are all places where AI can be useful and beneficial to you as an organization. Um, you know, long term, there's there's it's interesting to think about, right? It's it's uh, you know, it's a little bit like the matrix to me sometimes when I think about it. I'm reading an interesting book right now that that is about AI and automation. It talks about achieving hyper automation, um, and really what that is 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 this. Uh, it's a combination. What the author says it's a combi combination of conversational AI, what they call composable architecture, and no code application architecture. So the composable architecture is really, if you think about it, you know, it's like LinkedIn logs, right? They give you the, an architecture that gives you the pieces, but allows you to arrange it in whatever way makes sense for you, right? Using a common method of communication. Um, I think that what, what the promise is of hyper automation is that we can ultimately, um, we can have a conversation with a computer and tell them what we want to do and that can be translated in a matter of days or weeks into an output as opposed to months or years, which is the current cycle, right? Um, and I think that that achieving that level of hyper automation is a, an interesting and exciting prospect. I think we're still a ways away from that. I mean, that this is uh, uh, there's lots of stories out there and news articles, as you know, about some of the pitfalls of the use of some of these tools still they're still in their infancy. Um, but I think hyper automation to me kind of is is gives the promise of the end user really ultimately having the potential to be the change instead of being impacted by the change. I, as the end user, might in the future be able to say just in a conversation, not having to know code, not having to know how to translate something into a set of business requirements. This is what I want to accomplish and, and have that translated into an output for me. That that's that's a pretty neat prospect. It's amazing to think where where we could be in three, five years from now. Just, I mean, just even chat, BG, chat GPT launching earlier last year to where it is today. Um, you know, everybody has fun with it to write haikus and raps or whatever. But it's it's really, truly amazing how quickly it's learning your language output and, and the change of that. Um, I love that. Um, okay, so what's the name of the oh, book? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, it's called The Age of Invisible Machines. Age of Invisible Machines. By Rob Machines. Wilson. Okay. It's a very interesting, it's, a, and it's an interesting read. I'm enjoying it so far. But it is, it is a little bit, sit back and prepare yourself for the matrix, right? Because you do have to sort of think uh, way down the road in the future, right? Very interesting. I'm going to put it on my list to read. Thanks for that. And you're right. What, what we're seeing today, I think the stuff that is more real for us in our industry today is taking those mundane tasks, doing, you know, we always get that term AI and automation. Some some offices, they're interchangeable. It's like, well, we're doing this. Well, and in reality, it's replacing some mundane tasks to get your people on the phone more, to increase your time to fill, um, whatever that looks like. But in reality, it's just, it's doing a portion of tasks for you. So I love that. And I think we're just going to continue to see more of that. But hopefully, I think 
as, as I see or in the industry, we, we can't lose that human element either because that's where we continue to gain our key accounts or have those good relationships. Yeah. So um, hopefully that still stays a part I of our equation. Agree. And I think that's where the things that you, the work that you do around training um, is so, so important in this process, right? Because I agree with you, we've always been a people-centered industry. I, I don't see that ever completely going away, but, but helping bring people along in the journey to understand how their role may change, how their job may change, upskilling them, um, you know, helping them to understand what their job of the future might look like and helping them to see the benefit of that is, is critical. Yeah, ideally, we're not replacing anybody. We're helping people do things at scale and do sure. things faster. And actually, uh, on the panel that I was on at SIA, they talked about that. They did. They have a poll, and they said, you know, how many of you plan to use automation to reduce headcount? And the vast majority said they were not intending. They were not implementing automation for the purpose of reducing headcount. It was to improve efficiencies and to be able to, like you said, leverage their resources on more high-value tasks. That's such good insight. And I think that's reassuring to a lot of people in our industry. Absolutely. I think I only have two more questions for you, Holly. I think the first one I have is how do you manage stakeholder expectations during technology implementation projects? Again, I will say some of this seems simple, but it is a step that often gets missed in really documenting it really thoughtfully, um, thinking through it. One is making sure you know all of your stakeholders, right? Making sure you have the inventory. I, it sounds obvious, but I can tell you, I can't tell you how many times I've been on a project where we've had to revisit a decision because we didn't have the right people in the room when we were having the discussion, right? So really understanding all of your stakeholders. Um, and like you said, make sure you're thinking of everybody, right? We, we have a tendency as a service people focused industry to look externally and to look at our clients, to look at our candidates. Uh, to look at our vendors and their experience with us, right? But but don't forget about the folks internally as well who are going to have to inter interface with the technology. Um, and then I'd say communication is regular and you know frequent communication. And I would say one of the key elements of this, there's a tendency to think of communication as one directional on a project, right? Which is I'm going to share with you every once in a while, here's where we are and here's what's going on. And that's important too, right? But I think providing a, a communication structure that has a feedback loop is really important where the stakeholders have the ability to provide feedback back to you, right, is really important, particularly when you're undergoing a change, right? Everybody wants that, that helps the stakeholders to feel like they have some control over that change to be able to have input into it. So I think having that, that feedback cycle is really important. And then the other biggest thing I would say is having a decision-making process that um, helps everybody to understand how that stakeholder input is um, ingested and how decisions are made based on that, right? Because oftentimes what you're dealing with is competing stakeholder expectations, right? I want to do this. I want to do this. How do we reconcile those two and making sure you have a good process within your uh, project to ensure that you're decisioning those things in a manner that manages those expectations and then are communicating that back to your stakeholders as well. That's really interesting. That's something people don't often think about or even determine how those decisions are made. You know, sometimes we all get in a room and then it's like, no, I like this, no, I like this. Are we at a standstill? Are we at a draw? Or who trumps who? Um, it's really the idea that, you know, uh, people have the best intentions whenever we yeah. get into change. But I love, the communication, understanding the why, um, so you get more investment and really, really giving that open feedback loop is something that probably is a guess that I don't think that probably happens as frequently I, as I it completely should. agree. I think there's a hesitance, but what I've seen in our industry is there's a, there's a reticence to get the business, you know, recruiters and salespeople involved in the process too much because there's a, there's a perception that we're taking them away from revenue generating activities. Um, and we don't want to do that. And, that, and, and there, is a, there is a too much on that as well, right? But, but it's sort of pay me now or pay me later. If you don't sort of take that and pull them into the process early, now you're going to pay for that on the, on the back end. So I would say don't, don't be afraid as well to, to engage with the people, the recruiters and the salespeople within your organization that are going to be fundamental to adopting the change. Make sure they're a part of that journey. That's a great 
great insight. All right, the last question I have for you, Holly, I just kind of threw this in as a bonus for the fact that you you were talking about the SIA panel at Executive Forum, and you were on one of those uh, one of the conversations, and it was what to automate and when. So for those who missed it, can you maybe give us your top three things to automate as, you know, oftentimes we look at this big picture item to say, oh my gosh, I need to do all of these things. Um, and in reality, we need to eat the elephant one bite at a time. We need to start small or we need to start with certain processes. Um, any insight from that panel that you were on or any of your own personal thoughts of where do they start in the automation? Process? I think that's a great question. And I think it's, it's less about a specific technology and more about where can you achieve the highest value the fastest? right? Where, where can you really achieve your, your highest value and how can you do that quickly? Um, so uh, in some cases, it's going to be automating a back-end process. In some cases, it's going to be, you know, automating something up front, but it's based on where your organization sits today and what you can quickly achieve that will give you the highest value. I'd say that's, that's definitely a priority in what, what to automate and when. Um, you know, I would also say making sure that you are considering your rate of change, how quickly you can consume the change. Um, it should inform what you're automating, right? If you're looking at a massive ERP overhaul, um, you know, that that's a big bite of the elephant. Are you prepared to take that now? Or are there ways that you can do that in smaller chunks that sort of that get you there along that journey, but with with smaller bites of the apple, so to speak? Yeah. You know, as we, again, we get into this and it's such this big picture, it's almost paralyzing to yeah. be like, oh, what, what? Yeah. Are yeah. So yeah. And I mean, so. don't forget the fundamentals, right? It's just like building a house. I mean, do I have a good solid ATS? Do I have a good timekeeping system? Do I have a good tool for getting customers their invoices on time and get paid? I mean, it's make sure that those fundamentals, the foundation of your house is built, right? And then you can layer, you know, the other pieces on top of it as well. It's good to have your own roadmap internally for technologies to say, what do you want to adopt when um, so you can stagger those changes? Um, and, you know, as we talk about that, you know, oftentimes we get to the point where like, OK, let's add this technology. Do you have any like line of sight and advice for people to say, all right, how often do you revisit those to say, are they working out to my benefit? Like you know, we talked about assessing those technologies to say, was it mm -hmm. successful? But oftentimes we. We check the box, it was successful in the beginning, and we just keep going with the horse with blinders. Do you ever have, had any, have any advice to say, revisit these annually, quarterly, or at least have line of sight? Do you have any suggestions for people that are had implemented something new and they haven't revisited it? Yeah, since? I would for sure say um, revisit it as, as frequently as you can. I think, again, the most important thing to me would be building. It's really this mindset of building into your culture, this mindset of continuous improvement. If you can build that into your organization, into your technology organization and build processes around that, that will that will create that cycle of how are we doing? What do we need to change? How do we how do we prioritize that change? How do we implement it and then cycle through it again? Right. How, how did we do? What did we learn? How do we do better? Right. I think that iterative incorporating that iterative um, life cycle into your processes and into your technology organization uh, will help, I think, give you the, the structure to be revisiting those things consistently and making improvements along the way. It's a part yeah. of the culture. It's just like a learning culture. It's a change culture. It's whatever you need it to be, but consistency. Yes, is absolutely. Key. I mean, it's it sounds cliche, but the only thing constant is change. So having a process that enables you to, you know, to lead the change, you know, implement the change, and then learn from the change and iterate on that is is going to position you for success. Holly, I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation today. Um, thank you for your valuable insights on digital transformation, technology integration with us today. I know some of these are, are high level, but at least it can hopefully give our audience a steering of where to go, what to keep in mind as they create their own technology. Yeah, I had a great time. Thank you very much for having me. Enjoyed the conversation as well. I, I love to talk about this stuff, so appreciate it. Thank you. Um, and as for our audience, operation managers, leaders, and the staffing and recruiting industry, it's important to keep in mind the importance of a strong foundation, as well as a well-defined process before implementing new technologies for uh, increased efficiencies and scale. 
Holly highlighted some common mistakes to avoid and key factors to consider when selecting technology solutions for your organization. It's also crucial to stay up to date on trends and developments and technologies to remain competitive in this evolving industry. Most importantly, don't forget to ensure long-term long success. It's important to choose that purpose-built solution as the foundation of your technology stack to build off of. So I hope this conversation with Holly has provided you insights, actionable items, and continued to lead your charge towards success in the upcoming year. Thank you so much for joining us today. Stay tuned. This month is a busy month for us. Keep an eye out for our next live event on April 11th as we talk about how to get yourself off the KPI hamster wheel. Um, also dropping another workshop on auditing your tech stack on April 13th. So lots of goodies to come this month. Be on the lookout. Thanks so much for listening to the Industry Spotlight. I'm Courtney Harmon with Crelate. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Industry Spotlight, a new series from the Full Desk Experience. New episodes will be dropping monthly. Be sure you're subscribed to our podcast so you can catch the next Industry Spotlight episode and all episodes of the Full Desk Experience here or wherever you listen.